Uh, hi, I'm Madonna. I'm your worst nightmare. To rule the world. Why don't you show them what you do, honey? You've never had more fun with anyone else. People, people, we've got to move on to the next song. Somewhere I'm in sweet between. and I'm a bitch, you know what I mean? And that's always been the way it is. I'm, I'm a human being. <laughs> I'm waiting. Hey everybody, this is Louis Extravaganza, and you are listening to the MLVC, the Madonna Podcast. Hey guys, it's Tony, and um, you know, somebody sent some big fat man up in the front to give me dirty looks all night. (laughs) Hey everybody, it's (laughs) Stefan. Welcome to MLVC, the Madonna Podcast, your place for everything Madonna, Louise, Veronica, Ciccone, and yes, you heard correctly, on today's show, we are joined by none other than Louis Extravaganza. Louis, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Welcome, Louis. Hi. Thank you. This is the first legendary child we've had on the show. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's true. And well, yeah, did you our- guy Guido on, too? Yes, but he's not one of the legendary children. He is one of the deli- <laughs> he he delivers the message, you know. Yes, he did deliver the message. <laughs> so and for super everyone, adorable too. Oh, he's great. Oh, he's great. Yeah. yeah. For, so for everyone listening to the podcast, I assume we don't need to give an introduction for who Lewis is. But on the off chance you are new to the world of Madonna, it's a small little intro for Lewis. Lewis came to fame through the New York City ball scene and basically introduced Madonna to the world of voguing. Lewis appeared in the iconic Vogue video and was one of her dancers in the Blonde Ambition Tour as well as was one of the leads in the best rockumentaries of all time, Truth or Dare. And in 2016, Lewis was reunited with his troupe of Blonde Ambition dancers for the critically acclaimed documentary Strike Pose. These days, he can be heard on the airwaves now with his very own bi-weekly podcast aptly titled Work. <laughs> so good to have you here, Lewis. It's, it's really such a pleasure to be here. Thank you guys so much. I know you, you're a busy man, so thanks for carving out time, everyone. Lewis is he's on his way to a gelato class. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do tell us about that. <laughs> I thought it was a pottery class, but it's maybe it's you make the pottery and then put the gelato in it. I don't know. Oh my god. Well, I asked the universe to expand my, you know, my boundaries and my territory. And uh my friend Kevin Chase bid on a he was at a charity event, a charity event and he bid on a prize and it was take you and your 10 friends and go gelato making. So it's happening today. Fun. Very yeah. cool. So let's start at the very beginning. Mm. Um, so let's talk about your origin story. So I read that you and Jose met at LaGuardia High School and started going to balls. So how old were you and, and how did you get like, you know, get into that world? They were paying off the door, man. That's how they were getting <laughs> in. <laughs> uh, yes, we did meet in high school at the High School of LaGuardia of Performing Arts. I was a sophomore and he came in as a freshman Mm -hmm. and we clicked immediately him, me, our friend Aldona, uh, Derek. And so we just kind of started hanging out and I honestly, God, if I remember correctly, I think one of the other guys in the dance program was already kind of like in a house. I don't Mm -hmm. don't remember his name, but, we all kind of just kind of gravitated to, towards each other. And so, you know, as people of color do. And uh, we just started kind of like hanging out. And I was really just kind of coming out of my proverbial closet then. So yeah. and trying to find my voice, my footing in life. And so we would hang out after school and play Red Light, Green Light, Vogue, which was my <laughs> first, yes, which is my first introduction to anything Vogue or voguing. Yeah, and, so, does, oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. It, it, I mean, it's exactly what you think it, it is. You know, Red Light, Green Light, Vogue, somebody turns around and says, Red Light, Green Light, you know, one, two, three, and you're supposed to 
get as far up to the person as you can. And when he turns around, you have to hit a Vogue pose. <laughs> so cool. And so <laughs> the more creative your pose was, the chance you got to move up. Mm-hmm. So and were, were there death drops involved at that point? So there were no death drops involved. We called them dips back then, Kansai dips. Mm-hmm. And so they were a little bit more controlled, whereas, you know, you kind of went down on your knee and then turned yourself upside down and blah, blah, blah. Uh, today, they're just, uh, I, don't, I don't even know how. <laughs> it's almost like that. someone's collapsing. Yeah. Yes. I don't know how they do that. I mean, it's fascinating to see. I I don't know how they don't blow out a knee or oh, break God, their I back know. or have a concussion, but God bless them. They better work. Yeah. I, mm, if I, I tried a death drop, I would die. Like, yeah. I, yeah that my, would be my the knee end of would, yeah, my kneecap would blow out of my <laughs> leg. It, I, I don't, yeah, I tried. <laughs> so, Lewis, I was this week. I was looking at the newly released Criterion edition of Paris is Burning, and yes. you know, there's a lot of great extras. You know, like for example, all of those queens were on the Joan Rivers show, pretty much teaching her what was going on. You know, yes. But you were on the periphery of that um, yes. while it was happening. So describe a little bit what what was coming out of that scene, because I know um, you know a year before Madonna, there was Malcolm McLaren. So these yes. things were kind of you know, uh, bubbling up to the top, right? It's fun. It's funny because there is a moment in that movie where they're talking about Butch Queen and drags Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Paris takes off her hat and she is walking and the camera's following her and she's saying, Butch Queen, Butch Queen. So that moment is the moment where she's literally, she's walking up to me and I am... I am the butch queen in drag at the end of that scene. They just cut they just cut it. I ended up on the editing room floor. Which oh, is- that's bad. Yeah, because I was wondering because I did catch Jose in there for like a quick second. And yes, I'm like, you well, see who Jose voguing be around the corner, I'm sure. <laughs> and so literally she's walking towards me because my first categories was Butch Queen in Drag. It wasn't Vogue. Mm-hmm. So she's literally walking up to me talking about Butch Queen and drag, and I'm at the end of that runway. Mm -hmm. When I was walking Butch Queen and drag that night, another uh, trans person came and started started to walk against me, but she was trans, so they were like, she's not a Butch Queen, you know, la, la, la. And so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it gets contentious oh yeah, yeah i was gonna say that they probably were using other words <laughs> yes and so <laughs> paris was like okay wait stop because paris is a butch queen in drag right mm-hmm. they call yeah. i mean she's effeminate but she's not taking moans or anything like that mm-hmm. right so they were like, this is a butch queen category. So then all my friends were like, you got to rip your dress. You got to show them that you're a butch queen. So literally, little Lewis had actually <laughs> sewn the top and the skirt together of that outfit. <laughs> it oh was actually God, a God. top and a skirt. And they ripped it apart and oh, they made no. it into a mini skirt and a top. And then they pulled out my breasts. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so embarrassing right now. <laughs> So, Lewis, tell us, when did you and how did you sort of get involved in the House of Extravaganza? Uh, It was sort of in high school and just a young little queen back then. (laughs) And I met Jose in high school and we kind of clicked immediately. And it's funny because I wasn't an extravaganza right off the bat. I was a La May. I was in the house of LaMay first. Shout out to Ronald LaMay, honey. And um, (laughs) so the, wait, so the, the houses were before you got involved in the balls then. So it's, yes. Okay. Cause I wasn't sure if it was like, you could only get in a house once you were at a ball, but it was the other way around. You had to be in a house in order to get into a ball. Well, it happened kind of like at this, at the same time. So I met Ronald and them and all, you know, all the guys, that I was hanging out with at the time were from different houses. You know, some were La Beja, some were La Mays. And I didn't meet the extravaganzas until much later. You have to understand that 
that houses um, in Harlem were predominantly African American. So right. mm-hmm. it was only natural that I would meet, you know, my black brothers and sisters first before, you know, I sought out, well, not seek out, but find the House of Extravaganza, which was right. a more natural fit for me, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Although I was, I was in the House of LeMay and I had myself a good old time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as one does. So once you're in the House of Extravaganza, yes. so what was the progression towards uh, Blonde Ambition? Did you Were you one of the people that saw the ad in the paper or were you brought in in another way? We were brought in in another way. So my this is like six degrees of separation. You know that game with like Kevin oh, yeah. Bacon? Mm-hmm. So this is it's how also it re- part of living in New York too, right? Yes, and this is how and this is how it happened. So at the time, Madonna's makeup artist was Debbie Mazar. Mm-hmm. Oh, Debbie Mazar. Yeah, we want her on the podcast. I think yes. I've heard of her. <laughs> we love Debbie Mazar. And shout mm-hmm. out to Debbie. But so at the time, she was her makeup artist, becoming before becoming this fantastic actress. Right. She was a makeup artist, and then her friend, oh, I forgot his name, was the hairstylist for her. Mm -hmm. And Madonna mentioned that she was looking for Vogers for her video because she was doing a song about Vogue. And Debbie was like, oh my God, my friend, you know, so-and-so, his boyfriend is an extravaganza and they all Vogue and this, that, the other. And Madonna was like, oh, have them send me a tape. Mm-hmm. So it was literally a videotape. <laughs> yes, it was literally my friend Lewis's boyfriend was friends with the hairstylist who was friends with Debbie, who was friends with Madonna. Mm-hmm. So we all got together at this club called Nell's on 14th Street. I remember Nell's. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, really? Yes. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody had a video camera, probably David DePino. And you know, we just put on some music and started voguing in front of this camera. Like no kind of sense or rhyme or reason to it. It was just like they just turned it on and we just all started voguing. Sort of like that moment in the the second chorus of the Vogue video when you and the guys are just going at it. Yes. Mm. And, you know, we went there, we did the tape and we pressed on. (laughs) <laughs> so how long did you have to, how long did you wait until someone got in touch with you um i don't remember exactly probably like two three months mm-hmm. to, to the point where you'd probably forgotten that you did it you know yeah. you're just like well, oh madonna's the, not calling us well honestly for me and jose you know we were wrapped up in school and we were just uh you know, at the time, the House of Extravaganza was gaining notoriety and kind of doing the crossover thing where mm-hmm. media, there was a lot more media attention towards like the club scene and mm-hmm. the, the houses and stuff like that. So, right. And you guys did the life ball for Suzanne Barch that year, yes, right? Yes, we did the yeah. life, we were doing the life ball. But before all that, we were traveling mm-hmm. doing voguing gigs. And at the time, me, Jose, and a couple of us from the House of Extravaganza were in Japan mm. doing a tour, opening clubs and, you know, voguing in nightclubs and all that good stuff. And then we get the call. Actually, I think it was the second time we were going to Japan, or maybe this is the first. I can't remember. But in the middle of the tour, we they, they call us, and they were like... Uh, Madonna wants to see you. We need you to fly back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we do. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, they changed everything. They changed flights for us, and then we flew back. And uh, we met her at Trax. Did you guys ever go to Trax? No. What, where was that? On 18th Street. Trax. And like 10th Avenue. Oh, that that, that was like around the corner from the Roxy, right? That's my yeah. that's my neck yeah. of the woods now. It's I love that that neighborhood has changed so much since oh God, uh, back in so those much. days. 
back in those days. Woof. I knew we used to go to tracks, <laughs> and the Roxy, and all yeah. that. Anyway. And the Roxy, Roxy is now high rise apartments. Just Are so you kidding? Know. No. Oh I, I, I live around the corner and I look at it every day and I'm like, I can't believe that Roxy used to be there and now it's just high rise condos. <gasps> you got to love New York. They're building all these places for people to live, but there's nowhere for them to go. Yeah, I exactly. Know, huh? <laughs> That's crazy. It used to be a roller skating rink too, but yeah, mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. that. I ah, the good old days. Yes. So we met her at Trax, so and like it was an afternoon, and you know David DePino was the DJ at Trax, so he opened up the club, and he just started playing records, mm-hmm. and they opened up the doors to the street, and we're just you know hanging out there, and then a limo pulls up, and out pops Madonna, and the first thing I said to her was oh my god you're so little because she was tiny like i don't know i felt like she was so tiny and cute and blonde and white and i was like wow i didn't know this was madonna so (laughs) (laughs) i thought she was black (laughs) (laughs) well she says a lot of people thought she was black when she started singing and no one knew what she looked like so yeah. So so she went in there and she watched you. I mean, it was kind of like a an informal audition, and then yes, it was we, very we, informal. She were you guys just kind of hired on the spot? No. So no. we go in. <laughs> David starts DJing. She sits down on one of the little square things that people sit, you know, like a ch- square box, right? And she was like, "Show me what you got." And so we just started voguing all over the place. And um, and then she said, "That's cool, thanks." And you know, we just kind of like kicking with her at the at mm-hmm. the moment. And then she was like, um, "What are you guys doing later? What are you guys doing tonight?" And I'm like, "We're going to the Sound Factory. You know, you should come with us. We know uh, Junior Vasquez. We'll get you on the list. La la la. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we'll get you on the list. <laughs> yeah, we can get you on the list, girl. Come on." <laughs> and so she came out with us. And, oh fun. You know, at, at I didn't know I mean I knew she was popular. I didn't know she was that popular. But when we walked <laughs> right, in you didn't her, know you you didn't know you were going in with one of the biggest pop stars in the world at the time. I mean sheepishly, no, I didn't. And so, you know, I thought she was like a club girl, you know, like she's gonna be cool and and then it was just so much bigger than what I thought it was going to be. And we walked into that club with her and everybody just gagged. I was like, Mm -hmm. oh, okay. (laughs) And so... Okay, Miss Thang. Okay. And so (laughs) me and Jose and, you know, our friends of the House of Extravagant, we were kind of used to being the 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 ones, right? (laughs) And, you know, now it's like uh, we're playing second fiddle to Madonna, which was great, but it was just like, oh, I didn't know she was this popular, which was kind of... Fun. So we get, uh, she invites us to come to the audition. And we go to the audition and they're running the audition and they're doing traditional dance moves. So we're doing them and she stops and she says, Do you guys know how to dance dance? I was like, Yeah, we go, we went to the high school performing arts. We're trained dancers. And she was like, Oh my God, I didn't know that. She thought we were just street, you know, like street. Dancers, like vulgar street dancers. Mm-hmm. Um, she didn't know that we went to the high school performing arts and had classical training. You should have also given her a videotape of fame. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So you guys get hired and yeah, I, I want to skip a little bit ahead. So yeah. do you guys, do you remember when she did the, the 1989 VMAs and she did express yourself as the first time we see Madonna Vogue? Did you guys have anything to do with that? Or, um, we did not. Did, you did not. Okay. So then you start rehearsals for the show and I want to know how much of the choreography you and Jose brought to the show because I, I see it here and there, you know, but I, I want to get your definitive word. So when we were first hired, we were hired to choreograph the Vogue video. Okay. So that was first and foremost. And then after the Vogue video, she invited us to kind of like stay and do the tour. Mm -hmm. Vince Patterson was the director and the choreographer of the tour. 
Um, so he did most of the choreography mm-hmm. for everything. Now we choreographed the Vogue video, and then when the Vogue section in the show was me and Jose because they just took the choreography from the video and just flopped it onto the you know the stage right version, and then. La, like a virgin was also a collaborative between mm-hmm. us and Vince Vincent. You know, he was like, let's try to do something like this. And we were like, mm-hmm. well, what about this? And so it was more of a collaborative effort. Oh my God. What a moment having all three of you on stage, just going crazy. I mean, that's, that's the most iconic part of that show. It I was one say. of my favorite parts of the show because we can kind of get away with being a little like dark. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody and, had ever seen anything like that on stage before. Yeah, and let me tell you, Lewis, when I was I was 16 seeing Blonde Ambition, my mother oh my, God, sh- so was I. <laughs> my mother chaperoned me to the show. I love it. And um when Like a Virgin came on she took the binoculars away from me because <laughs> she, I was like, Mom, I'll just watch what they're doing on the screen. And <laughs> And it, it was a treat. Let's let's just say. Um, so with with blonde ambition, um, we do a lightning round here with with our guests. But I'm going to sort of lightning Fine. round you on lightning round you on blonde ambition. So okay. I think you sort of already answered this. But what was your favorite number to perform? Was it like a virgin, or did you have another favorite number? So it was like a virgin, but like a prayer was also my favorite number to do. Yeah, it's, I love that the the uh, arrangement of that i, I love, love one of my favorite things that she did during that period was when the group of you guys oh, I love would shuffle your feet and mm-hmm. the yes. whole group would sort of just sort of like seem like they're just like floating across from side yes. to side oh, Lewis, but i just I, love that moment with me and the other guy dancers and we're just mm-hmm. doing a, something a little bit more classical and just you know elevated and with the music, it was just so beautiful. I would cry sometimes because <laughs> the music was so beautiful. And just what we were trying to say was was so trans, you know, was just so far beyond what the surface of the message was, right? It was, yeah. just, mm-hmm. it was just so beautiful. It was great for me. I have to bring something up because I saw um, opening night in Houston, Texas, which was opening night in the United States. And... Um, she was spinning around during like a prayer and that cross hit her in the head, right? Oh yeah. (laughs) She had a little cut. (laughs) 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 But she still wore, she still wore that huge ass cross every night, you know? Yep. Um, So do you have a special memory from the tour? Something that like maybe wasn't included in like truth or dare or something that, that you hold close to your heart? Oh my God. They're so... I mean, there's so many. There was, um, we were in Spain and I forgot, we we had a party for like Pedro Abaldivar. That's when she Mm -hmm. met Antonio Banderas and all that good Mm -hmm. stuff. Well, I did a drag show at that party. Oh, wow. We didn't Uh see that. That's no, on the that's on that. the that's the uncut version of <laughs> Truth you. or Dare. So yeah, we were just, in we're London before we went to Spain, and in London, uh, the reps at Vita. For some reason, everybody knew that I was going to do this number, so I asked like Jo. Excuse me, I asked Joanne Gare and Rob Sadusky, who worked on the tour, mm-hmm. hair and costumes, respectfully to help me. And so they got me in touch with like the representatives at Vidal Sassoon and they, Mm. the reps at Vidal Sassoon came over and they like styled this wig on me. And it was like one of their signature, like Bob wigs. And then um, Rob got me in touch with this designer called Zandra Rhodes in London. In London, yeah. And so they got me this you know, blue beaded dress and heels and all that good stuff. And I did this drag show for Pedro Maldivar and Madonna and, you know. I mean, from the looks of it, that was like the party of the year in Madrid that year. Yeah. 
And, so uh, I have a quick question. Did yes. you do you still have the tour jacket from Blonde Ambition? Because I love that jacket. Oh my god, we lost after that tour jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I God, I have it somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I have it somewhere. Well, and it's time I to take it out for a spin. Yeah, I would love to find it because the the emblem in the back I had bugle beaded. Oh. I had it fully bugle beaded, and um, I would love to know where that jacket is. So yeah, well, I was gonna say if you ever if you ever need to like buffer your retirement plan, just <laughs> pull that jacket out and I'm sell serious. it on eBay for a couple grand, and you'll be good to go. I'm serious. Good. Yeah. I'm serious. serious. Okay. So moving along, because we have so much more to talk about. Post. So obviously, Blind Ambition, one of the most iconic Madonna tours ever, it elevated the concert pop concert game, um, and I'm sure all the pop stars today are jealous that they weren't weren't doing it first. First, we do have to mention, though, uh, an accolade. You and Jose received a nomination for the Video Music Award for Best Choreography. That was awesome. Yes, yes, yes. thank you. And, and also that iconic performance that no one will ever forget, ever. Yes, I brought <laughs> I brought my fan along so I, I could, so, so I so I could crack it just because I was like I'm like. <laughs> I just loved cracking a fan thanks to that performance. Hey, but hopefully and he, now he, he, at yeah. every party you go to, a queen is cracking a fan. It's just like, <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <laughs> and I think honestly, it be, is because th- there was so much fan cracking. Or did you have to see, like, obviously with the rehearsals of that, like they must have had to practice those fan flips for ages. Yes, they practiced the f- fan flips for ages. Every time they practice it, somebody's fan fell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's one two they pre-recorded the fan cracks on yeah, microphones yeah, yeah. before the show and three when they performed it it was the first time that nobody dropped their fan oh how funny so they we, must have been so relieved so when <laughs> you know you see us clapping it was a real like who girl thank god <laughs> So post Blonde Ambition, you guys were bona fide celebrities. I mean, you you had one of the most recognizable faces of the, the 90s, and um, rightfully so. I mean, you were in that Rock the Vote TV ad in 1992 that was literally on MTV during every commercial break. Oh, my God. I have that on a videotape somewhere. It was like a Madonna compilation of, mm-hmm. of that. I, I used to love that commercial. And then if you watched videos, then suddenly Lisa Lisa's Let the Beat Hit Him would show up, and you were in that too, you know? Um, I love and then, Lisa Lisa Velez, honey. Oh, Shout out me to Lisa too. Velez. I live for her. And she sounds exactly as she does on the record. Like, uh, the way you hear it on the record is exactly uh-huh. how she sounds. She's amazing. I stand her. I love her. And I... I hope to see her live around here in New York. One I of these days. was I was at a party for some ad event, and Lisa Lisa was the closing act. <gasps> I, and I was like, "Oh my god, it's Lisa Lisa!" And I was like, "Oh, I hope she sings this song. I hope she sings." This. And she did. She yeah, sang she, it all. She's got all the songs. And yes. oh, and speaking of recording artists, uh, Maverick recording artist Jose Luis uh, with the hit single "Queen's English." Mm-hmm. Yay. Mm-hmm. I remember buying the New Faces CD and I was just obsessed and I'm like why don't I just get like a full full length album from these guys but um, I know that's what we were asking too <laughs> 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 But I mean it, that's huge you, you, your first single featuring Madonna on backing vocals you know Queens that read are the best I mean that was your project so uh, tell us a little bit about that We were really fortunate to have her be so supportive Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, here we are, two guys from the Lower East Side, you know, thinking we're all of that and (laughs) believing it. Because y'all were. (laughs) And, you know, selling it to, you know, the greatest pop star, you know, of our time. Yeah. Or so I thought and still think. Um, So that's totally my opinion. But, um, you know, we're selling this idea to her like oh we want to do a record we want to be fierce and she's like well you know if you want to uh really do it you got to work hard and this that the other and uh you know show me what you got and maybe i'll introduce you around and she did and uh she you know made um you know made it come to fruition 
Mm-hmm. So, so who produced that? Who who did the music for that? Junior Vasquez. Nice. Yeah. So it was Ruby. oh, just a, just a little DJ, you know, <laughs> just just a little, just some little guy who was trying to make it big in the industry. Well, I mean, because it was sort of like family back then, right? So yeah. because we went to the Sound Factory and we knew Junior for a long time, you know, at that point, and so it was like natural it's like oh of course he's yeah. going to produce this of mm-hmm. course he's going to sing background you know so kind of like it was this little uh you know crew that we had going on which was great i'm, I'm lewis i mean with this was so ahead of its time i mean when you look at now how you know drag race is kind of like over you know shown us you know drag culture ball culture to a degree as as well as paris is burning and pose and, you know, also the fact that, like, you know, middle-aged housewives in the Midwest used the terms that were, you know, underground back then, you know, like they're all saying on point and all that stuff. And, it, it, you know, I'm rolling my eyes. I'm sure you are, too. <laughs> but, you know, what you guys did it was, you know, it was kind of like swept under the rug because people didn't know what to do with it. But, you know, now you guys are, you know, kind of like the architects of a lot of this, you know, you know, culture that's out there now for lack of yeah. a better word well i mean thank you I, i'm you know humbled and honored that you say that but you're you know you're right so <laughs> <we've been> t- <laughs> well, the, in, well you're right in the sense that we were saying these terms that are being mm-hmm. so like overused today and i'm yeah. not saying they're being overused by the girls at drag race or rupaul That's not what I'm saying. I have the greatest respect for RuPaul. I mean, I've known RuPaul, you know, for a long time. Her and the crew at World of Wonder, you know, are close to my heart and I just love them and respect them. And so, yes, RuPaul gets to say all the things that she says. Yes, Mm -hmm. absolutely. But she earned the right to do that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, because she, you know, she was coming up when we were coming up. She was, you know, we the same gang, right? So, you know, Miss Honey in the middle of nowhere, mom, you know, trying to be like, (laughs) Karen, you know, (laughs) reprimand her kid. She's like, you better work it or get in this car or blah, blah, blah. It's just like, oh, honey, (laughs) I just don't know where that comes from. (laughs) I, you I hear it all really the time. It me- you know, you don't really know what it means. I mean, we use these words with more gravitas than that. You mm-hmm. know? I mean, when we say work, we really meant like, oh my God, you better do it to the mm-hmm. tenth degree because you are living right now. Exactly, <laughs> so- and the reason the reason that you know all that that vocabulary be- was so essential, you know, in the eighties, even before then, is because you guys had a code that you didn't want anyone else to break. Yeah, yeah. And it was ours. And I mean, we were saying, you know, yes, bitch, yes. <laughs> We've been saying that for years. And it's cool. I mean, hey, look, yeah. the whole thing is having a renaissance, you know, and Vogue is having a, this new renaissance and all that good stuff. I'm here for it. I respect it. it. I'm loving it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's but all good if they're to, still talking about it. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, just to be, you know, crystal clear on all of this, we've re- we were we've been saying that mm-hmm. you know long ago so it's old hat for us and for some of the newer uh people yeah. coming in it's new for them which is great as it's long like, as like you say it's still being you know put yeah. out there and uh you know it's like the song says good. following in the footsteps of the legendary children yeah, yeah. and Again, there's room for everybody to say whatever they want, just as long as everybody knows just <laughs> the history of it. Because mm-hmm. we don't we don't move forward unless we know our history. Yeah, know where we came from. Right? So in 2016, there was a documentary that came out called Strike a Pose, and that there was, was? A- oh, <laughs> oh yeah, and it was and good. It was such a wonderful documentary. Both Tony and I happened to be at the. Uh, Tribeca Film Festival premiere in New York where you and the cast were um, oh unbeknownst goodness. to us. Tony and I did not know each other at no. the time, but um, we were in the same room with all that greatness and it was so much fun to sort of be there at that premiere and have all the fans like literally just like choking up and crying and it was such an emotional, wonderful experience to sort of see, pick up the story of you guys and your lives and where you're at because you know, seeing that movie, seeing Truth or Dare when we were young, impressionable, mm-hmm. in the closet, 
it was so wonderful to see that for the first time for many Madonna fans or just gay men in general, that was their first exposure to gay men on film yeah. and living their lives and being proud. And like, I know for me personally, it was the first time I was able to see a pride parade. Me too. You know, me to too. see two men kiss and mm -hmm. what, what, you know, what, what's, what am I feeling inside? What is, the, what's happening? It was the first time I heard guys say boots and I still really don't know what that means, <laughs> but I say it anyway, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But no, that documentary meant a lot to all of us. I mean, we, it, it was when, when it became a thing, I was like, oh my God, my prayers have been answered because I, I wanted a follow up that wasn't specifically about her. I wanted to know about you guys. Yeah, which is what I thought was great that the directors sort of brought your story to the forefront. And, you know, Madonna was there in the background, but it yes. was mostly focused on your lives and where you're, where you came from. And so I just, wanted to ask just a couple quick questions. Why did you feel it was important to be involved in that documentary? Well, the funny thing is I didn't feel that way in the beginning. Mm. I was one of the last ones to kind of hop on board this project. The crew was from Holland, Dutch crew, which I love them so much now. They really kind of just changed my outlook on the film, Kevin Stay was calling me and was like, hey, there is this Dutch crew. They want to do a movie on us. You know, call me so I can get you in contact. And I was just like, oh, Kevin, I can't, I can't do this right now. <laughs> I can't do this. I don't want to be involved in another movie about Madonna. I love her, but if I get another question about whether she eats salad with her hands or a fork. I'm just going to fucking <laughs> jump through the window. Like, I can't, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, 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 it's about us. It's really about us and what we're doing today and blah, blah, blah. So I called them and, you know, they were going to be in Los Angeles and I set up a dinner with them and we spoke and... Even after the dinner, I was like, I'll think about it. And they were like, mother fuck. <laughs> <laughs> He's playing hard to get. I know. And I was like, what did Jose say? They were like, well, Jose hasn't gotten back to us. And so, of course, I was like, well, if Jose does it, then I'll do it. And then, of mm -hmm. course, Jose on the other side is like, well, if Lewis does it, then I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, oh, my God. I think they lied to us and said Probably. You know, that the other was doing it so that we can say yes. It was very funny. And did they tell you when they were sort of pitching the project that like how integral dance was going to be to the, to the film? Because I think that was one of the most beautiful surprises of that movie yeah. um, to me was how much of a dance movie it is. They didn't say that to me. What got me was one of the producer directors, his name was Ryer told me his story and how he came to see the tour and what it meant to him and uh, to his partner, Esther, who was the other producer director and how they were having a conversation about that whole time. And they were like, I wonder what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And literally that's how the idea kind of came to fruition at, from a conversation like I wonder what happened to those guys and mm -hmm. so they started googling our names and then it just turned into this like deep dive and then they were like this is a movie we're gonna turn this into a movie <laughs> that's how it I don't I'm know it, when the dance aspect came to fruition for them in their minds or in their storyline but I was very happy about that as well yeah, it was just, it was beautiful to watch that you guys, you know, were still so much a part of dance and that dance yes. was still in your life. I mean, you're still, you teach dance to this I do. day. I do. And do, uh, do you teach a Vogue class? class. Yes, is it a, is it a Vogue? work class. Oh, yeah. I can, do you do drop-ins? Next time I'm in LA, I'll just come and drop in on the class. Me does. too. I'm telling you, if you ever come to Los Angeles, please, please, please let me know and we will get it on and pop in. Oh yeah, no, that's I'm I'm it's happening. Don't worry. If it, if the coronavirus doesn't strike us all down, <laughs> then 
it, it will happen. Yeah, well, I don't drink Corona, so I'm good. <laughs> Did you hear that that actually is happening? That people, there's like a percentage of people who are not, they're boycotting mm-hmm. the Corona beer because they think that's how they get the coronavirus. Yeah, it's probably those it, same women that call everyone shady when they don't even know what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, their stock dropped 30%. So there you have it. Yeah. I'm oh like, it's so ridiculous. Um, so I know that everyone from the Strike Pose movie was at that premiere. Do you still keep in touch with a lot of the dancers from that movie? Or is it Absolutely. sort of like life is just busy? Or No, no, no. I still keep in touch with every one of them. A lot of Carlton and Kevin in my life because they live near me here in Los mm-hmm. Angeles. So I'm always speaking to them and having lunch with them. Anytime I'm in New York, I make sure I see Jose and Slam. And anytime I'm in... Vegas, I make sure I, you know, reach out to Oliver, who's even more busier than us. That is so cool because um, it, it's, um, it, it, you know, it happens with us with older friends, you know, you meet up again and it's like no time has passed, right? It's weird how that, how that always happens with us. Like we fall right into place. The Kiki. <laughs> yeah. We fall right back into the Kiki is crazy. Mm-hmm. And it's so great to see Oliver's evolution, you know, because he was literally a child, you know, and he's just grown up. And and just to see that in the film was, was, was really cool. I'm so proud of him and his work and what he's doing in Vegas. You know, that kind of turn around and shift in perspective towards another person and how they live their lives is so commendable. And it's honestly what we'd like to see in more people, right? Yeah. 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 So you had mentioned having lunch with Carlton and Kevin because they're in LA and you're chatting yes. with them. I know that they uh, you've ha- chatted with them on a certain project that you're working on. Tell us about the work podcast. Yes, please. <laughs> How, what prompted you to start that? Uh, other than the fact that everyone and their mother has a podcast these days, you know, it's. Yes. I mean, it seems like podcasting is the thing to do. So, uh, but yeah, but you got to have something to say. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, <laughs> what? What? You and Kim Blackwell decided to come together and tell us how that started. I was doing my week, my monthly work dance class, and. Uh, you can access that by going to workdanceclass.com. Quick mm-hmm. plug. Plug, plug. And um, I don't know. I create a really, really, I try to create a really safe space for people to come and express themselves and mm-hmm. be who they want to be in this realm of voguing and dance. And I was listening to a podcast uh I forgot whose podcast was it. And, you know, they were like, oh, we did, we were doing this and it kind of related to what this podcast was. And I was like, oh, that's sort of like work, like people coming and expressing themselves in this dance class, you know, and being free of. Judgment. Yeah, of judgment and all that, all that crazy stuff that people are dealing with in this climate I would love to do that in a podcast. They were like, yeah, work the podcast. I was like, huh. Hmm. I was like, but I don't know if I could do it by myself. Maybe I need a co-host. Mm-hmm. And, I was like, and so I was at this, my friend, Kim Blackwell. Love her. Love Kim Blackwell. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's great. My, yeah, she's my family. She lets and you have it sometimes on this podcast. It's I love it. I fucking... <laughs> Love it. And, um, you know, we were going to Disneyland because her husband works for Disney. Mm-hmm. So we get she gets passes all the time. So we were at Disneyland and we were just having a conversation. And I was just, for some reason, I was hearing her in a different way than I've ever, ever heard her before. And I was like, wow, she would be, she would be good. I love the way her voice sounds. That she's really smart and funny. And I was like, "Do you want to do a podcast with me? I have this idea." She was like, "Sure, let's do it." <laughs> and um, 
And in true to form, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then, you know, I get busy again and I forgot about the podcast idea. And then later on, she was like, hey, did you still want to do that podcast? And I was like, oh, my God. Yes, I do. I do want to do that podcast. So we just kind of got together and literally we're just learning as we go. Right. Mm hmm. Heard that. Yeah, we know all about that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the best way to do it. You yeah, know? podcasting by the seat of our pants. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm telling you, she was the one that told me about you guys. She was like, have you heard of the MLVC podcast? <laughs> and I was like, MLVC. Why does that sound? Oh. <laughs> because it's on the back of your damn blonde ambition <laughs> tour jacket. I was like, <laughs> oh, uh, right. That girl. I right. what this podcast is now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, MLVC, why does that sound? Oh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, we also want to be a safe space for people with unhealthy Madonna obsessions. You know? <laughs> I mean, why not? Oh, my God. Or why healthy, not? whichever way there, you choose no, I was going to gonna say, it. there is no unhealthy yeah. Madonna obsession. <laughs> it's all, you know, as long as you're not attacking her on stage. Exactly. Oh, my God. Uh, wait, Lewis, tell us about um, your experience at Madame X. I know that you went to see it when it was in L.A. What's your, what were your thoughts of the show? I like the show. Um, I really liked, you know, let me, let me say this first. Everybody is so used to that wham, bam, thank you, bam, Madonna show, right? Where it's like Mm -hmm. all of the laser lights, all of the technology, all of the glitz and the glamour. So it was really refreshing to come to a show and see hardly any of that. Mm Yeah. It was more intimate. You can see her up close and personal. There's no bad seat in these venues because they're so much smaller. Right. And you kind of get to see Madonna kind of like up close and personal, which was great. So I loved all that. This seemed a little, this seemed more personal to her. This seemed much more of a, this is what I discovered in this part of my life. And let me share that with you, which I really appreciated. And I don't know, she was just, it was a new side of Madonna, which I think everybody uh, was ready, you know, was ready for. Yeah. I I thought it was time to, I mean, I, in the last couple of, you know, tours, I, I always thought to myself, like, God, I wish I could just see her like in a nightclub, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And here we go. The photo club appears. Yeah. And wasn't that so I, beautiful too? Ugh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a great moment. And it was great to see her, you know, go full international because, you know, she loves, you know, you know, exalting other cultures. So it was great to, re- to see her really have the freedom to do these, these kind of things. Yeah. But she's injured. So she's, uh, I know she's not, I'm, she's swearing up and down. That she's, yes. We, oh, yeah. we, we saw, saw it a couple of times. I think <laughs> <laughs> just a well, humble amount of shows. Shows twice, so. I, I mean, she was in Brooklyn for three weeks. What am I supposed to do? Not go yeah, see her. Right. right. Not you know, go <laughs> three weeks in a row. Sure. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, Oh, it's a Thursday night. Madonna's performing in Brooklyn. Let's just hop on a train and go. <laughs> yeah. Let's just do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Oh, hey, Matt. But uh, yeah, well, no, we do. It. I actually got to beer bitch with her in uh, Philadelphia, so I was very ecstatic. But come on now, yes. But Madonna was <laughs> Madonna was not in a good mood that night, so I I, I got sort of a uh, a bit of an affronty Madonna. She was uh, <laughs> she just was not in a playful mood, which was it's kind of fun because I'd rather have that than a you know. Oh yeah, she was great. Right. But it's um, so weird how you know whatever mood she's in. You know, the fans are just like, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and she can say, fuck you, queens. And everybody's like, yeah! <laughs> yeah. Um, so for every guest that we have on the show, we like to do a little lightning round of Madonna-related questions. So this it. is just something I'm going to ask you. It's wherever you are in your life today. It doesn't have to mean this is forever. Is this a, a, a Louis Extravaganza-centric Lightning round. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sure. So I was trying to get that out. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely, Tony. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, right. so, He's really good looking, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what is your personal favorite Madonna video? Mm. Oh, my 
God, what is my favorite Madonna video? Can't be the one that you're in. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, that's one of my favorite Madonna videos. I gotta say, like, if if you if it's sort of like that Desert Island discs, where if like if you were stuck on a desert island and you were right. told you can only listen to like one Madonna song or one Madonna video, Vogue. it would be Vogue. Um, I love. Um, oh my god. She's going to kill me. Um, it was directed by Herb Ritz. It was on the beach with the little oh. kid, the mermaid. Cherish. Cherish, of course. Cherish. Cherish. Yeah, that's a good one. One of those. Um, do you have a favorite Madonna look? And it could be from a video, a tour, a photo shoot. My favorite Madonna look is Borderline. Mm, uh, classic. Yeah. Yes. Old school Madonna. So beautiful. Oh my God. So effing. She was so beautiful. I just, and she was like, like I wearing all that neon, hanging out with the Latinos. I did. <laughs> oh my God. I, I lusted did. after that guy. Who, who was that guy? Was that Jellybean? Na- no, his name was, uh, he, he became a recording artist. His name was Louis Louis. Remember? That's who's in that video? Yeah. That's who he was. He was hot. Yeah. Uh, last question. Favorite piece of Madonna memorabilia other than the tour jacket? Favorite piece of Madonna memorabilia. Oh, God. Uh, well, the the Jean Paul Gaultier stuff that we got to keep, like my cage vest. Oh, and all that stuff. What did you get to keep? <laughs> uh, we got to keep the Vogue tights. Uh, Put your Vogue costume on, and that's your costume yes, for the that's night. Your costume. Oh, you I just mean. you run around your house at night. That's your like little. <laughs> instead of slipping in the PJs, you well, slip into God, the Vogue all, costume. All these years, you know, I, I'm afraid <laughs> to touch it because you know, if you pull it, it'll start to like disintegrate. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so, done, right? <laughs> yeah, it's done. It's been you know a couple of years now. So. Oh, you know which outfit I stand? Oh, it's the. Uh, the causing a commotion hoodies oh that you God. guys were wearing. Oh yeah, no, the, but the Chevron, boys, was the boys tops. people wore them too. Yeah, the boys had them too. Oh, yep. I just remember Nikki, Don, and Madonna were all wearing. Well, those. I was looking and at mind dancers. You, <laughs> mind you, ours were not. Um, some of them were just tops, but some of them were onesies, like short oh, uh, booty looking mm. onesies too. Oh, fabulous. Do you still have the crucifix that she gave you? Not crucifix. The, the rosary. The rosary. The rosary. Right? My mom has that. Oh, oh nice. Yes. That was such a beautiful moment in Truth or Dare. Yeah. There were but many. I collect, ro- I collect rosaries, so I have a bunch of them all over my house. Mm, like a prayer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, Louis, we know that you have to go make gelato. Um, <laughs> make the gelato. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Um, th- and I'm sure we could chat and chat and chat away for the rest of the day, but... Um, Thank you so much for coming on the show. We really oh appreciate it. Thank you it. so yes. much for having me. Thank you for your time. You guys have to check out the Work Podcast. It's spelled W E R Q U E. You can find that on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And you can also find our podcast on Apple Podcasts. Yeah, and once you binge the Work mm-hmm. Podcast and then binge the MLVC podcast if you haven't already. Actually, the best thing is that wh- whether you're listening to MLVC or work, their recommendation is the other. Yes. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen that. Okay, yeah. well. So like, it's like, if you like work, you should listen to MLVC. <laughs> and by, and I see that first, all the I'm time. Like, oh, every, time I, every time I type in on, uh, to, find my spot, uh, to find our podcast in Spotify, your podcast always comes up. It's like, you should listen to this. And I'm like, I am yeah. already listening to Spotify. Well, I feel like we're in, I feel like we're in good company. I, I, I love your podcast and I recommend anyone who hasn't listened to it to just get in there. Just jump in, you know, Thank start you at the so beginning much. or start with the latest one. I'm telling you, I tell I tell our listeners the same thing. I'm like, if you ain't listening to us, you should be listening to MLVC, Aww. the Madonna podcast. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you. So, with that, we're gonna we're gonna say goodbye. Thanks again for your time, Lewis. And we are you are now a friend of the podcast. So feel free oh, to come God. back whenever you want. Yeah, if you're ever Thank in New you. York, drop us a line. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. And we're setting up the your podcast on our on our on our show. So. 
we'll oh. be speaking to you guys very soon. Ah, uh, thanks. Oh my God, it's our first crossover. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I've always had crossover dreams. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Check us out next time on Apple Podcasts, as I mentioned, Spotify, like and subscribe, rate and review, and we'll see you guys very soon. Bye. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.